Emil Milan was a highly skilled woodworker and sculptor who lived from 1922 to 1985. He lived in his native northern New Jersey till 1962, at which time he moved to Thompson, very rural Thompson, Pennsylvania, bought a defunct dairy farm, lived in the house, and used the barn across the street as his studio. Emil was in World War II as an MP. When the war was over, he used his GI Bill to go to the Art Students League in New York City. He did figurative sculpture, mostly at the Art Students League, but he continued doing it occasionally throughout his life. At some point, however, he developed the idea of making functional objects like bowls and spoons and things that could be used in a home, but these had very sculptural qualities. They were sold for a time at major New York City department stores, and Hammerker Schlemmer had it. And we've seen a uh, brief review of his work in an old article from the New York Times. The other thing that he was known for was his decision to incorporate both hand tools like gouges that he would have learned for traditional sculpture at the Art Students League with power tools, particularly abrasives and sanders, not just to refine the finish on a piece, but also just to shape the piece. He may not have been the very first person to do it, but he was certainly very important in developing that. It must be every artist's dream. You've spent your life creating things of beauty and meaning, but you enter your grave relatively unknown. But then, fellow artists see the great value of what you have achieved and refuse to let you sink into obscurity. They bring you back. This dream has become a reality for the artist and craftsman Emil Molan thanks to the efforts of three colleagues. Phil Juris, who built a friendship with Emil Milan in the 1960s and studied with him. Norm Sartorius, who never met Emil, but became a huge fan of his work. And me, Barry Gordon. Who spent one unforgettable afternoon with Emil a few years before Emil died. These three fellow craftsmen have been researching the life and work of Milan, organizing shows of his work, and bringing him to the attention of new audiences across the country. Jennifer Zwilling is the curator of the Emil Milan Show at Philadelphia's Center for Art in Wood. The exhibition represents several different aspects of Milan's work. Figural studies of human and animal forms, exuberant abstractions, and functional sculpture inspired by his natural and formal explorations. Homage by Norm Sartorius is a Milan style bowl entwined with a spoon form in Sartorius' style. The poetry of the two symbiotic forms encapsulates our goal to rediscover Emma Milan and illuminate his circle of influence. My name is Norman Sartorius. Everybody calls me Norm. I live in Parkersburg, West Virginia. I'm a spoon carver. Sculptural, one-of-a-kind, very fancy pieces of wood. In 2005, I bought a little salt dish on eBay made by Emma Milan. When it came, it was sitting on a shelf here at home, and a little dish that I made in the 70s was sitting close to it. And my wife saw the two bowls. She said, your work is very similar to this man's. And I said, yeah, he's the guy who taught my first teacher, Phil Juris. That was like a light bulb in my head. I contacted Phil Juris and his wife, Sandy, and I said, would you write down everything that you remember about Emma Milan? A little after that, I got in touch with Barry, and I asked him the same question, and I looked online. There were three pieces in the Museum of Art and Design in New York City, and one piece in the Smithsonian Collection under Emma Milan's name. So I contacted both museums. They had so little information about this man, even though they had the work in their permanent collection. Barry and Phil and I talked about it, the three of us agreed that we would start tracking down what we could learn about Emma Milan just 
to satisfy our own curiosity. We proceeded to do that for a while until I was at a woodworking event in Asheville, North Carolina. And one of the places that we went down there was called the Center for Craft, Creativity, and Design. We heard about this opportunity for a research grant. They gave us $14,000 for what ended up being about two years' worth of work, where we interviewed over 40 people, had the interviews transcribed, collected a few hundred photographs from family and friends, magazine articles, just a tremendous amount of effort and documentation. In October of 2011, we turned in a report in fulfillment of that grant. Now, that report is housed in a loose-leaf notebook, archival materials, that is approximately four inches thick. And about 14 copies were made, including ones to the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian, the Yale Art Gallery, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Museum of Art and Design in New York. The American Craft Library, Peters Valley Craft Center, where Emil taught for 12 years, the Historical Society of the County where he lived in Pennsylvania, and to half a dozen other academic centers for the study of craft. Hi, I'm Phil Juris. My introduction to Emil was in 1963. Along with my wife, I met Emil at a small craft show in Bradford County in northern Pennsylvania and began a several decade long relationship as a mentor to us and a friend. We often watched him work in his barn workshop. He was always willing to share his knowledge. When I first visited his home, we thought, well, he's a bachelor. He probably doesn't cook for himself. So my wife put together a really nice meal. Arriving at his home, he welcomed us in. He was very gracious and accepted it. However, when we finally sat down, he got out a very large, beautiful salad bowl that he obviously had made and put together one of the most unusual salads I think I ever saw. Everything that he had gathered from little forays out into the woods, some mushrooms and nuts, in addition to the greens and some berries, and they all went into this marvelous salad. We realized he did know how to cook. He also knew how to bake, and baking pies was one of the things that he did very well. While we were talking, he was showing us many pieces he made, and among them was this beautiful kneeling nude figure that he had carved while he was serving in the army. He was in Normandy a couple of days after the invasion. And he was sitting, whittling away on a piece of wood when the sergeant came up to him and said, real men don't do things like that. The sergeant left. Not to be deterred, Emil carved this figure, which a couple of days later he brought out and showed to the sergeant. The sergeant was quite taken aback. What Emil did, one could not make any comments that negated the skill that he had. Milan's eye for transforming gestures found in nature into pleasing art to be used in the home capitalized on the popularity of the biomorphic mid-century modern style. His interest in the beauty of wood, the hybridization of hand and machine production methods, and a sense of play allowed him to create unique, affordable forms that customers cherished as heirlooms. Norm talked about a commercial venture that Emil started after his Art Students League days with a man named David Kittredge. This business called Buckridge Contemporary Design was Emil's designs. David Kittredge would market this line of work to department stores in New York City. Emil trained employees to work with his methods and design. It was a small shop, two, three, four, five employees at the most, but he's watching the clock and he's managing it's an approach to work that he eventually rejected. He did not want his life to be reduced to just an ability to labor. I'm not sure that I could speak for him accurately and say what he wanted, but it wasn't that he was solely a formidable worker. He wanted something more than that. He wanted control of his time, less pressure. He didn't want to supervise other people and tell them what to do. Buckridge Contemporary Design was right in downtown Orange, New Jersey. 
at some point in 1962, the state of New Jersey let residents and businesses that were in the way of a new highway the state intended to build, that they were going to be forced to move. The Buckridge business did move to Jersey City, but Emil did not go with it. He bought this derelict dairy farm out in the country near Thompson, Pennsylvania, and proceeded to move there. He and his dog seemed to enjoy a more carefree approach to life. Emil loved to be out in nature. He enjoyed taking walks, looking at birds, plants. He was quite knowledgeable about wild mushrooms. He liked to pick apples from the apple trees dotting his property. I remember talking to him one day on the telephone. Well, what are you doing, Emil? And he said, well, I'm watching the groundhogs. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's, that's a good idea. Bird forms allowed Milan to experiment with a language of simplified natural curves that could stand as tabletop sculpture and be translated into art objects for everyday life. He was known for his birds and their wonderful fish, and then some purely abstract pieces that very much influenced by Brancusi. He was also known for his efficiency in using wood. Say he was making a large bowl, and then there has to be a piece cut off there. That became a sculptural bird. There are stories of him using his firewood to make smaller pieces and even keeping his house colder than it should have been because he didn't want to burn the wood that he could make objects from. Watching him work was a dazzling experience. He used a bandsaw in a way that it was a carving tool. I was amazed at how he preformed bowls, birds, cooking instruments, taking his wood, running it through that bandsaw blade, making very close cuts. He used his tools, the bandsaw, gouges, belt sander, in such a way that he and the tool became one flowing motion. He was a very physically powerful man, and he could do things on the bandsaw that, uh, first of all, were very risky and very, very difficult for other woodworkers to do. It was as if he was conducting a symphony. His swift and fluid movements, his mastery of the tool use, it was a performance. One of us coined the term ballet with bandsaw. We knew that the noted painter Robert Stark had held a one-person show for Emil in 1980. That was the only one-person show that he ever had. As we were doing our research, we kept saying to ourselves, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a show now? But the three of us had no resources to do that, and we just had to accept it. But at a craft fair, Norm was befriended by a man who would end up helping to write the next chapter in Emil Milan's comeback. Craig Gittelbrock, who's the chancellor of Penn State University, a Great Valley campus, learned about the Emil Milan research. Penn State had a nice gallery on the campus, and he offered us a show. Craig and his staff did an incredible job of setting up and presenting Emil. The entry to the gallery is up a set of broad stairs. And I have to say that each of the three of us, when we came up the stairs for the first time ourselves before the show had opened, uh, there were tears in our eyes. This is a very emotional thing for us. That show opened in June 2014 and was up all summer long. Albert Lacoff is the director of the Center for Art and Wood. I've known Albert for many, many years. And he was aware of the research project a couple times during the project. He had helped us. Albert offered to bring the Emil Milan show to Philadelphia after its summer run at Penn State. There were 88 pieces on exhibit at Penn State. 78 of them are now on exhibit at the center. And the second show also includes work by artists who were trained or influenced by Emil Milan. Teaching was a major focus in Milan's life. At Peters Valley Craft Center and other venues, he collected a loyal following of students who often became friends. Inspired by his quiet geniality, generosity, and discerning criticism, 
Many of his former students credit Milan with inspiring them to pursue artistic careers. The work in the exhibition, by his circle of influence, represents a range from first inspirations that mimic the teacher's style to fully formed, unique artistic voices that still sing the praises of their master. Probably his most important role was his teaching, perpetuating craft, but also taking it a couple of steps ahead. As part of a U.S. AID program in Honduras, Emil taught craft skills and production methods to provide income in poverty-stricken areas. And he taught as part of a Penn State College of Agriculture program using the Manpower Training Act of the federal government. Emil was not so much a teacher by words as by example. His criticism was always in a positive direction rather than giving the negative. He might have seen the negative, but he said, let's do this next time instead of saying you did it wrong. We only know of one woman who was a part of his life. Her name was Audrey Nunn. She was a painter whom he met at the Art Students League. He never married. He had no children. Still had plenty of friends, and people would come to get the work that he made, and he still traveled to teach quite a bit. He never really talked much about his life. He spoke, though, about religious, political, philosophical matters, international affairs. We talked about the craft world and making things. But to see into his own soul, that was a door that never was opened up. It is our primary goal to give him the recognition among mid-century woodworkers, people like George Nakashima and Wendell Castle, we feel Emil deserves it. So it's an adventure. The enjoyable part of it is it's a detective story. And we keep finding these new matters, these new leads. We correct ourselves sometimes. I'm convinced that we did find the needle in the haystack. It was threaded. And this thread has followed through, connecting so many lives. It is an incredible fabric that we have been able to piece together. The people whom we have met because of him, how much influence he had over so many different individuals' lives. What I've learned above all from this project is the profound creative and spiritual impact Emma Milan had on those around him his friends, students, and the collectors of his work. There are many stories of his gentle encouragement giving a young artist the courage to pursue an artistic life. This project has brought the three of us researchers very close together. So then we realized what Emil's doing. Wherever he is, he is pulling the strings that are bringing these people together, and he is smiling. <laughs>